I'm going to ask Andre Dijanowski to come up. Um, Andre spells his name in a way that makes it harder for us to say, but he'll tell you exactly how he pronounces it. I think one of the most ironic, there's a couple of ironic things about the hay market. One is that um, his um, studio is across the street from the cemetery. And it's such a, you know, it's so amazing when we were trying to figure out who we were going to use, we actually interviewed some people in other places. And Andre's work is nationally renowned, it's internationally renowned, and it's worth just going over to his studio, that little white building that I forget, he'll tell you what it once was. And um, his work is impeccable, and um, I think you're going to see that on May 1st. Um, I want to say one thing, though, about the history, because a lot of people, I think most of you know this, but a lot of people go, what's this got to do with May Day and uh, with the workers of the world? And um, the, the connection is that in 1889, at a, a gathering of international unionists from around the world called the Second International in Paris, France, with an American representative there, people got together and said, we will from here on honor the martyrs of Chicago and call it May Day, International Workers' Day. Um, and that is really how it began, um, as International Workers' Day, because there was this growing trade union movement and the idea that workers around the world had to connect up. It's a struggle we still have. Uh, as I say today, if you labor history lives in your closet, because probably anybody in this room, if they have anything that they're wearing, is made in the United States. It would be rare, because labor lives. The, the race to the bottom is why we need workers to unite around the world, because we now are selling, making sure, you know, paying workers 25 cents an hour instead of the $7 a day, because the Mexicans make too much money to be able to make things to make the profit we want to make. So we send it to China or Indonesia or somewhere else. Uh, but uh, uh, to, in order to not digress, I want to bring up Andre to talk about the process and some of the things, that, and the interesting things that he has since uh, uh, been involved in as he got commissioned last year to do this project. So if you'd all uh, welcome Andre Dajnowski. yet in perfect condition. As you can see here, uh, we have uh, the floor reef arrangement that was in perfect shape, and this tiny plaque that currently is missing. This is how the monument looked when I uh, saw it uh, the first time. The floor arrangement on the left uh, is gone. There is this tiny piece only. The plaque in the back was stolen. But the monument from a distance didn't actually look that bad, and the plaque from a distance didn't look that bad. The reason for that was very simple. Somebody, I don't know exactly when, 10, 20 years ago, decided to clean it, and in my professional opinion, whoever did the cleaning used materials that are normally used to clean copper roofs, which means very strong acids or bases, and just stripped everything from the bronze to bare metal. Make it look, made it look shiny, and uh, probably some people have it who didn't know what the monument was, was supposed to look like. Uh, this tiny element that was uh, here on the very bottom, it was the only thing that was left from the floral arrangement, and uh, Mark brought to me, and actually Mark has a story about how he found this piece, it was laying down around the cemetery somewhere, if he didn't stumble on it, it would have been completely missing. Uh, there were other mysteries. Uh, this uh, laurel litter that uh, the lady holds or is holding in her left hand, I thought that it was bent seriously based on this old picture that shows this kind of curved line. But this picture is shot from a much lower angle. And when you look at the same arrangement from the front of it, which means from the side of the sculpture, you see that there is actually no curvature. Everything is the way it was supposed to be. So nothing got damaged luckily over there. And when you look closer to the sculpture, you see that during the past cleaning, uh, they went too far. But the nature or the environment takes uh, care of everything that is uh, left outside and quickly corrosion starts forming. The first corrosion product on copper metals uh, or copper alloys is copper oxide or copper oxide. There are a few that can form. And they are normally brown. That's why bronze is actually called, called bronze because brown in Italian, I think it's pronounced bronzo. 
Uh, and uh, the next product that develops on the surface is green corrosion, and that's actually slow process of decomposition of the metal. Metal is, gets, is getting converted to corrosion products. Corrosion products are getting washed out by acidic drain. And as a matter of fact, the bronze is disappearing very slowly, but yes. Uh, when this sculpture was made, the sculptor, uh, I'm not sure if accidentally or intentionally didn't match the design of the stone. Uh, probably, you know, it was a lot easier for him to go roughly with the bronze design and match it relatively closely and then use lead. This is this material that is still in all of the gaps around the bronze. Uh, so when you look at the bronze, you see that the surface is starting to turn green in many areas, but then you see this black staining on the stone. That's what's coming out of the bronze, of the surface of the bronze, and lands on the stone. And that also creates a problem for the, for the money. Although, in general, copper staining on buildings is positive because it prevents biological growth. Wherever copper uh, dissolving from the metal runs onto the surface of the stone, there will be no biological growth. Uh, but wherever the water runs on the surface, it creates kind of rivers. And those rivers, when you look at the surface closely, become extremely destructive. And uh, they prevent receiving the sculpture that it was supposed to be received by us, how the sculptor wanted uh, to kind of present his uh, sculpture that he created. And of course, in this case, in this mine, you see in the cemetery there are plenty of organic materials. This green staining that formed here uh, was, of course, created by organic uh, debris that was depositing on the surface. The treatment of this monument was relatively simple because somebody already did serious overcleaning, and uh, we just didn't want to go too far. So what we did, we removed loose corrosion products from the surface and uh, patinated only locally wherever it was necessary, and then hot wax the entire bronze. This is how the, black of, uh, the plaque looks. And actually, what's uh, interesting, the monument sits here, and my studio is right there. Another part of the monument, here is a plaque. Uh, actually, this plaque was seriously vandalized. There, is, there was red paint, some uh, eight signs, and uh, this was before treatment and after treatment. Uh, what I'd like to stress very strongly it is that many people who come to visit the monument to pay uh, respect to people who passed away, who represent many important things in the history of uh, labor union or labor uh, all over the world, they bring flowers and touch the monument, and those are two things that are the most destructive to the stone and to the bronze. <laughs> if you look at the sculptures in the, actually perfect example is St. Peter's Cathedral, where you see those huge marble or bronze sculptures with almost no toes, because somebody came up with the idea that if you rub your hand on that, you have uh, luck for the rest of your life or something like this. Here people think that if they touch the monument, they connect probably with people who passed away. What they really do is they put their fatty acids from their fingers onto the surface of the ground <laughs> and they corrode the ground farther. They, destroy, they cause deterioration of the surface. Flowers are great, but uh, as you can see in this picture, nobody takes care of them after they just leave them. Flowers create huge mass biological uh, debris, decomposes, stains the stone, stains the browns. Many people leave they memorabilia in terms of coins uh, and whoever leaves, whatever they leave, they leave there, just stays there until it decomposes. And then, <coughs> that's what happens to the rocks. It gets permanent staining that is extremely or close to impossible to remove. Because this staining combines if, if you think about a metallic uh, element, like for example, somebody left their button from the shirt or some, something made of, let's say, ferrous metal, ribbon with, with an iron wire, that will curl, decompose completely on the surface of the bronze and leave a stain that uh, no conservator can remove. We can only conceal its appearance on the surface. Another thing is uh, graffiti. And uh, 
<laughs> Actually, that's a, a nightmare for me because whenever we treat the monument, it's always uh, our hope that it will never be vandalized, but unfortunately it is. And here we have two different or three different kinds of graffiti, something that uh, they put this paper brochure for somebody to, for everybody to read, but he forgot the next evening it was raining and the brochure was not very readable. The graffiti, uh, when removed incorrectly, can damage the stone very, very seriously. Not the graffiti. People who remove graffiti damage the stone really seriously because they quite often embed the graffiti into the stone. And then you've got graffiti instead of in a form of a pain, you've got the graffiti in a form of indentation to the surface. And uh, at the same time, uh, well, although this image here I can show as something negative because there are flowers on the bronze, but this image presented me was extremely important information because there was this angle that I didn't have to look at this floral arrangement uh, anywhere else. I was able to compare all of the images that uh, were provided to us and recreate this shape. What was very important, and with all of those images, until I started using one more trick, uh, I positioned a, a line just above my head on the left side and tried to direct the line onto the surface of what I was working to establish this right distance between this piece and reproduction that we made of the monument in wood. I didn't know how far this piece uh, would extend into the space from the, from, the, from, the, from the wall of the stone. The same was true with all of these elements that uh, connect with each other. So shadow of what we see here was actually helping to create or recreate the missing element. The, the first thing that we did